The debate over climate change is heating up and it's all about you, or is it? I'll sit down with Abby Lewis, that's next. This Changes Everything. That is the title of a documentary on climate change by Avi Lewis and his wife Naomi Klein. And here to help us understand this idea is Avi Lewis. It's a real pleasure. So if we ignore climate change, what happens? Well, so first of all, we're acting like we're ignoring it. Our global emissions are not going down. They continue to go up. World leaders meet in the, in the great climate negotiations, and they committed in Copenhagen in 2009 to keeping warming within two degrees Celsius uh, over pre-industrial levels. And we're headed for four or six degrees. And that's not according to uh, environmentalists. That's the International Energy Agency, the World Bank, PricewaterhouseCoopers. They're the institutions that say that we're on the road to four to six degrees of warming. And that, and that future is radical. And what will it look like? We're already seeing it. Last summer, BC was on fire, Calgary was underwater for the second time in three years. I mean, we're already seeing it. This is not a problem for the future. It's not an abstract problem. It's a problem that's happening now, and, the, and it's going to get vastly, vastly worse unless we dramatically shift the kind of energy system and the kind of economy that we have. Watching your movie, I heard you and Naomi say, we've been under the spell of a 400-year-old story that we all take for granted and that it's not gonna work for us anymore. Take a look at the challenge you give us on that. Here's how it goes. The earth is not, as most people thought back then, a mother to be feared and revered. No, science had granted men godlike powers. The earth is a machine and we are its engineers its masters. We can sculpt it like a country garden. We can extract from it whatever we want. These scientists help turn the mother into the mother load. This story is where the long road to global warming began. When I realized that, I stopped tuning out those sad polar bears because unlike human nature, Stories are something we can change. And if we change that story, that technology helps us conquer and consume, what do you want us to replace it with? Well, this is, this is the profound question that we're trying to ask. And I think it gets to the root of the fact that the climate crisis is a spiritual crisis. It's a physical crisis in our environmental world. It's an economic crisis because the economic costs of climate change are incalculable, billions and billions of dollars that we're already seeing rebuilding after hurricanes and storms and floods and, and, and freak weather. But, um, but it's much more than that because it goes to the heart of how we run our societies. And for the past 400 years, fossil fuels have, have, have lifted this industrialization process that started you know, in, with the Industrial Revolution and colonialism and taken us into this place where, as we say in the film, we actually think that we can be apart from nature. So we think that, you know, that we can control and dominate with no consequences. And of course, people have known for thousands and thousands of years that that's not how it is. So the spiritual questions then are what? Is how do we restore a relationship of reciprocity with our environment? And it's, it's profoundly the same question as how we re restore a sense of reciprocity with each other. Are we atomized individuals, all pursuing our maximum self-interest, which somehow magically is supposed to produce the greatest good for everyone, which is capitalism. This is the premise of, from Adam Smith to Milton Friedman to Stephen Harper, this is the, uh, the economic idea that we've, been, that we've been sold. Or are we actually a complex system of interconnected and interrelated and interdependent beings with the natural world? And do we have to achieve balance? Avi, you took us into communities and showed us that we're actually living in a way that makes these places sacrifice zones. Tell us what you mean by sacrifice zones. Mm -hmm. Well, so the, one of the great ironies is that the, the greatest pools of carbon left on Earth 
like the tar sands in Alberta, like the coal under the Powder River Basin in Montana and, and Wyoming. A lot of them are on indigenous land. A lot of them are on land where indigenous people were put on reservations. And they were put on that land because it was not the best agricultural land. Uh, in the colonial period. And now there are vast pools of carbon underneath some of the poorest communities in the world. Um, and so now those pools of carbon are being dug up. Mountaintop uh, removal for coal mining, tar sands exploitation, uh, you know, and, and all of these extreme energy projects. So the people who live next to fossil fuel development are in the sacrifice zone. They're on the front lines of the dirtiest industries and they pay with their health. A million and a half people a year are dying, according to the most recent estimate, in China from air pollution, the vast majority of it caused by the burning of coal. China is a sacrifice zone. Look at the smog crisis in China. And in the tar sands, it's a sacrifice zone. People's health is affected by these vast extraction exercises. And we've been operating as a global society on the, on the premise that some people just have to be sacrificed if we want to have this kind of energy. It's another spiritual question, isn't it? It is, because, because what we're saying by just, just taking the kids to school, just making lunch, just going to the store, we're participating in a system which is saying some lives are worth less some people have to sacrifice so that we can have this privileged life. You have a little child. Are you not going to make them lunch and put it in saran wrap? Are you of not course, going to of course. drive them All of to those, school? Those are, those are the things that people do. We live in a system that constrains our choices. And right now we have a lot of bad choices. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with taking the kids to school. I'm saying while we go about our everyday lives, we're living in a system that depends on burning way too much fossil fuels and fueling this climate crisis. And we need a, a huge shift on a wartime footing to a different kind of energy system, to renewable energy. And we have an opportunity, and this is the exciting and hopeful part of our project, that if we were to shift off fossil fuels in Canada, as most Canadians know we need to do, we could do it in a justice-based way. You also introduced the idea of a carbon budget. And you propose that we've already stockpiled way too many fossil fuels. Uh, watch this. Almost every world leader agrees that if we're going to avoid truly catastrophic climate change, there's a red line we cannot cross. We need to restrict warming to no more than two degrees Celsius. Beyond that, the Earth's systems start to unravel. Think of it like a budget. If you want to stop the climate from going crazy, you can burn a certain amount of fossil fuel, and that's it. Here's the big problem. If you look at how much oil and coal and gas companies already have in their proven reserves, you'll notice one thing. It's up to five times as much as the entire carbon budget for the Earth. If we let them dig it all up, we're cooked. If it stays in the ground, we have a chance. You don't want us to dig up another barrel of oil. Why? The climate scientists of the world, the International Panel on Climate Change, the vast majority uh, of, of the world's climate scientists have issued in their latest report a strict carbon budget for planet Earth. This is not coming from me. I'm not a scientist. I'm a journalist who reads the science, and the science is incredibly clear. There's five times as much carbon on the balance sheets of fossil fuel companies as we can safely burn, and that's why we have to shift now. Avi, let's bring in someone who disagrees with you now. Um, we spoke earlier with the Honorable Stockwell Day, who left politics. He's working in the oil industry now. And uh, he's part of a $15 billion project, which would pull more bitumen out of the Alberta oil sands. And I told him, I think Avi would say, you're crazy. We don't need another barrel of oil. And here's what he had to say. I'll get you to react to it. But watch this. As much as I believe we are continuing to see advancements in things like solar power, uh, you are not going to address the drastic poverty needs, the malnutrition, the lack of clean water that is being faced by, it's actually in the billions uh, of people around the world, without getting uh, clean fuel to them um, in a way that's going to enhance their well-being, raise their standard of living, deal with their health issues, and you can do this with a project like this where you take that bitumen, which is flowing anyway, but let's get it to the right source, let's get it refined, let's make it safe to be, relatively safer to be on the water, 
and let's get it to these countries in a way in, in, in a form where even though they may not have the same environmental standards, we've already refined the product. And we've already dealt with that. It's actually, uh, I, I don't think it is being truly considerate of the billions of people still living in poverty to simply say we're going to screech all resources to a stop and until uh, solar or wind catches up with you, you're just going to have to deal with massive malnutrition, terrible uh, situations with water that is, is contaminated, no hospitals, no roads. There are answers to this that can be done in an environmentally sustainable way that pulls these people out of poverty and helps them to enjoy some of the creature comforts that we enjoy in the Western world. So Avi, what do you think? First of all, he's not speaking as a, as a, as a cabinet minister. He's speaking as a, as, a, as a fossil fuel executive. And this is a classic fossil fuel talking point. I've heard it from coal CEOs in India. I've heard it from coal uh, executives in, in, in Montana and Wyoming. I've heard it from oil workers and managers in, in, in Alberta. And this is just an industry talking point. It's not coming from science. It's not coming. It's 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 coming from spin doctors and from and from publicity firms. That there is not the, enough solar to the, help these people lift their this, level of with with of with great respect. That is crap. The price of solar has come down 75 percent in the last six years, and the and the poorest countries on earth need it the most. And I'll t and I'll give you perfect proof. China, that burns more coal than anywhere else in the world, is leading the charge to towards renewable energy. They declined their coal use in China for the first time last year first time this century last year. They're retiring the last coal plant outside Beijing this year. Bangladesh, a country with massive poverty problems, one of the most climate affected countries in the world, vast swaths of the Bangladeshi uh, 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 landscape is disappearing underneath the waves. And in Bangladesh, they're installing 60 to 70,000 solar arrays a month. They created 40,000 jobs in two years doing this. And in six years, the government of Bangladesh thinks that they'll have solar energy in every single village in that country. So everything you just heard is in the interest of the fossil fuel industries that want to keep burning this stuff. And we just can't do it anymore. And the poorest countries in the world will benefit most from this transition. And some of them are already doing it. What do you hope comes out of the Paris summit on climate change next month? Well, unfortunately, the governments of the world have, a lot of the major economies have already sort of said what their targets and what their positions are going to be, and nothing that's on the table there. And this comes from the chief negotiator, who's, who's, who's you know, so the, sort of the, the, the maven who's responsible yeah, for the talk. She talks. said 2.6. Yeah, she said it's nowhere near what science really demands in terms of, 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 of reducing emissions. But what we are seeing is pressure from below. And this is immensely, immensely gratifying, and it's very encouraging. The climate justice movement is on a roll. I was on the streets of New York a year ago with half a million people who are demanding climate action. There'll be even more mobilization uh, in Paris at the climate talks at the end of the year. And we're seeing like the divestment movement has exploded in three years. There's trillions of dollars of capital that is now pledging to get its investments out of fossil fuels from a movement that didn't even exist three years ago. So we're seeing tremendous movement and communities from First Nations communities installing solar in the tar sands region um, to some of the examples like Bangladesh that I, that I mentioned earlier are leading the way. What we need is governments to follow people who are organizing on this issue because people know what the solutions are. Coming up, Catherine Cahill, a Canadian climate scientist in Texas who shows how science and Christian faith fit together in fighting climate change. How do we know today's environmental crisis is real and not made up? Our next guest will be attending the UN's Paris Climate Summit, and she has some definite thoughts about that. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is a climate scientist whom Time magazine included in its list of the top 100 most influential people. She directs the Climate Science Center at Texas Tech University. Catherine, welcome to Context. My pleasure. Okay. Um, why do you think there are so many climate skeptics, especially in the U.S.? When you look at the statistics, there's a remarkable relationship between those of us who call ourselves Christians and especially evangelicals and people who say that climate isn't changing or if it is, then humans are responsible. But when we dig further into it, we realize it's nothing to do with our faith. It's the fact that increasingly especially south of the border, our faith has gotten married to our politics. And so here in the United States, the best predictor of what people think about climate change is simply where people fall on the political spectrum. The further people are to the right, 
the more likely that people are to think it's not a real problem. And the reason for that is because the people we trust are telling us that it isn't. Every time we turn on the TV, every time we go to our favorite news site, whether it's a Christian website or whether it's a conservative news show, they're telling us it isn't real. Well, Catherine, as you mentioned, the skeptics are in the faith communities and they're up here in Canada too. Uh, speak to us as a scientist who's also a Christian and you're a pastor's wife. What would you say to those faith-based critics? I have the amazing opportunity every day to study God's creation and to look at what it's telling us. And when we look at this world around us, we can see that our planet is changing. It is warming. It isn't just a matter of satellites and thermometers. There's over 26 and a half thousand indicators of a warming planet, many of them in our own backyards. I grew up in Toronto and it was always, um, it was always a big deal if the tulips managed to flower by the time it was my birthday in April. Well, now our spring is coming so earlier in the year that by the time my birthday comes in April, the tulips have come and gone. And that's just one example of things that we can see all across Canada and around the world. Now, we know that climate has changed in the past for natural reasons. We know all about natural cycles and energy from the sun. But when we look at all of these reasons one by one, we see that, no, nope, it can't be the sun because we'd be getting cooler. No, it can't be a natural cycle because we're going in one direction instead of going up and down. It can't be the, the same reason we had the ice ages because the next thing on our agenda is another ice age and instead we're warming faster and faster and faster. So I would tell people, you got good questions and you got good but what abouts. But we've been looking at those but what abouts for over a hundred years and we have good answers to them. Today, climate is changing. We know it's us and over 97% of scientists agree. Not only that, though, it's not just about what's in here. It's about what's in here, too. In our hearts as Christians, we believe that we've been given this new spirit and this new heart to agree with what God tells us. And God tells us, starting in Genesis, that we've been given responsibility to care for every living thing on this planet. And it goes all the way through the Bible to the New Testament, where we've been told that we are to be recognized by the love we have for others. So today, caring about climate change is not about hugging trees or polar bears. Nobody should try that. That's kind of dangerous. It's about caring for and taking responsibility for the creation that God has entrusted to us. And it's about loving others who are being impacted by a changing climate. Many of those, the poor and the disadvantaged and the people who don't have the resources we do, who we already want to care for. So... So what is the strongest evidence that you rely on for the scientific basis of climate change and, and having a chance to stop and interrupt that climate change? There's no one line of evidence for climate change. When we look in the world around us, we see tens of thousands of lines of evidence telling us that the planet is warming, whether it's sea level rising, glaciers melting, birds and insects and animals shifting further north, heat waves getting more frequent, hurricanes getting stronger. I mean, you can see the list just goes on and on and on and on. So everywhere we look, we see this evidence of a changing climate. And we have over 200 years of science that clearly connect the dots between the fact that when we burn coal and oil and gas, it produces carbon. That carbon is building up in the atmosphere. We can measure it. That carbon traps heat just like a blanket does. A blanket traps our body heat and keeps us warm at night. And our planet has this amazing natural blanket designed by God that traps the planet's heat, keeping us almost 30 degrees Celsius warmer than we would be otherwise. But we know that every time we burn coal or gas or oil, it produces this carbon that is in essence wrapping an extra blanket around our planet. And just like an extra blanket would keep us too warm at night if we didn't need that extra blanket, in the same way that extra blanket is keeping our planet warmer, warmer than it should be. Okay, I wanna talk about your faith. What has made you um, assure that Christianity is on a solid foundation? One of my favorite verses is Hebrews 11. It talks about how faith is the evidence of things that are not seen. And faith is what we expect in the future. I like it because at the same time as it defines faith, it defines science too. Science is the evidence of what we see with our eyes here and now. So rather than the two being in conflict with each other, they actually serve completely different purposes in our life. 
there are things that are not tangible that can never be measured with our most sophisticated scientific instruments. How can you measure the existence of someone's spirit? How can we even study what is outside the physical boundaries of our universe? We can't do that. And that's one of the reasons why many leading cosmologists are Christians is because they recognize the limits of science and they recognize that there is more beyond science. So for me, although, you know, issues certainly come up in our lives and doubt is healthy, for me, learning more about science has only reinforced my faith. Okay, and you have done a great job of reminding us that this calls us to affect our neighbors, our poor. Why is climate change a spiritual issue for you? Climate change is already affecting us today. It is no longer an issue that is distant in space or time. Since 1980, on average, we've lost about $5 billion worth of crops every year due to the increased variability in weather risks that come with the changing climate. We're seeing increased risks of billion dollar disasters, floods like they saw in Calgary and in Toronto just a few years ago, droughts like they're seeing in California and Texas today, events that are always part of normal life and they've always happened, but climate change is giving them that extra little oomph. It's like a really good baseball player taking steroids. The baseball player always had the potential to hit it out in the park, but with those steroids, it hits it that much farther, and we're bearing the consequences of that change. So why do we care about climate change? I care about climate change because I believe that we're told to love others as Christ loved us. We're told that we should be recognized in the world, not just as salt and light, but as love. And today, when we look around the world, the people who are most vulnerable and the people who are already suffering as a result of a changing climate are the people who don't have the resources to adapt. We have two thirds of the world's biggest cities within just a few feet of sea level, many of those in developing countries. Millions of people in Bangladesh, India, Southeast Asia, living in places where the oceans are already creeping up on their doorstep. And in a matter of decades, they will have nowhere left to live. We're seeing farmers in Africa who have planted by the rainy season for decades. And now, when the rains are supposed to come, they're not coming. And when it's supposed to be dry, the rains are coming and flooding their crops. And they can't feed their families anymore. We're seeing situations like Syria, which was already a very unstable country. Syria had many, many issues politically, economically, socially. But a few years ago, they had a killer drought that drought drove people into the cities that wouldn't be there ordinarily. It led to a 50% unemployment rate in Syria, which contributed directly to the situation that they're in today. Did climate change cause that? No. But climate change is exacerbating those types of humanitarian risks related to poverty, development, hunger, access to clean water, access to safe and secure social systems that offer us education and health care. Climate change is threatening all of those things, things that we care about because we care about people. And that's what God has put in our hearts today. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, climate scientist, uh, climate change scientist, evangelical Christian, and participant to the Paris Summit, thank you very much. Thank you, my pleasure. Okay, Sheldon, over to you with a question for our audience watching at home. Thank you so much, Lorna. Well, my question to you is this. When you look at the natural world we live in, do you see any evidence for a creator above and beyond us? Why or why not? At Context, we want to know what you think. Why don't you send us your answers by any of the means you see there on the screen. You can call, email, tweet, or Facebook us. You can also call us at the number 1-800-215-4913. Write to us at comments at contextwithlorna.com. And don't forget to join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter at Context TV. Coming up, some final thoughts on being the change you want to see. I've seldom seen a story have to battle so hard against the selfish trait to consume as I've seen in the global debate on climate change. The need to heal our environment gets lost in scientific sound bites and confusing carbon costing battles. But the wind did bring a rather simple sound bite my way on climate care. I heard it in Pope Francis's encyclical letter, Laudato Si, 
on care for our common home. In his examination of the crisis facing us on climate care, Pope Francis reminds us of the saint he chose his name for, Francis of Assisi. It seems that the original Francis was so good at care for this common home that he greeted everything, the animals, the plants, as brother or sister. Instead of just seeing something to consume in his world, Francis engaged his imagination with relationships. He saw the earth as part of the cycle of life that he cared for. And surely it can only help us in how we relate to each other and to our planet to shift to an imagination that has us care for life rather than a right to consume. So we've left links to our guests and their ideas and books today on our website. We need to keep learning on climate care. Please check out those resources and happy times as you reduce, reuse and recycle. For all of us, I'm Lorna Duick. Thank you for watching and join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. Well, last week on our family show, we had a special audience guest, Kelly DeVries, a Toronto woman with her own family struggles. Check out her blog online where she shares her personal story and the importance of creating a welcoming home. Well, if you watched our episode on Francis Fever, you'll know that the Pope is challenging the church to open its doors to people on the margins. But the church, well, maybe hasn't been so quick to say, let's do it. Read the stubborn agnostic's thoughts on our blog. Well, in her book, The Wild Truth, Corrine McCandless shares the story behind what led to her brother, Chris, to head into the Alaskan wilderness and inspired a famous novel and film. Watch our Q&A with her for Lorna's books. When I was working with students, I saw what a positive impact it had on them to have those blanks filled in and have the answers to all of their why questions. And it really took Chris beyond that literary legend he had become through Into the Wild. Well, you can find all these stories and more on our website at contextwithlornaduick.com.